evening, sir. Yeah, I, I take this opportunity to welcome you to this uh, weekend session. Uh, and of course, I congratulate you upon completing the week. I wish we could, uh, uh, as usual, start our session with a, a prayer and uh, I'll uh, pick at uh, random. Stella, you could uh, give us a word of prayer. You know, you know, ladies are uh, uh, so good at prayer. So Stella, give us a word of prayer so that we can uh, get into this session on water apply. Okay, good evening class. Uh, let's send ourselves a word of prayer. Loving Father, we thank you for the gift of life. We thank you for the journey masses. And we thank you for this session that we are going to go through today. Father, we, we ask you to send us your Holy Spirit so that we can be able to capture whatever the class <coughs> and the lecturer are going to share and also help those ones who have not joined to join us. In Jesus' name I've prayed. Amen. Amen. Uh, all right, so I first of all want uh, to know whether you, you can get me very well, because last time we had a lot of interruptions. Yes, sir, your network is so clear. Date is uh, good, sir. Okay, I managed to identify what the problem was. I realized when when you connect uh, from the phone, there is a way it reduces the intensity of, of, of the signal. So uh, at least now I, I have tried to fix that. Uh, yeah, so let's, uh, let's move on. Safe water supply. Uh, this is a key to this uh, module. And uh, in our previous uh, presentations, uh, I can't remember where uh, some group uh, made a good presentation about water, uh, especially water resources uh, management. Uh, and the key to this uh, is that water is is abundant, uh, as evidenced by water bodies ranging from surface to underground water sources. Uh, but despite this abundance, uh, water is uh, very scarce. Uh, looking at the fact that uh, almost 97% of, of the water that is uh, available is not uh, is, is, is salty and hence uh, not suitable for, for human consumption. Uh, uh, and only about 3% uh, can be readily available for human consumption. Um, well, don't mind so much about the picture on the slide. That picture was taken from one of the of the schools in northern Uganda uh, while they were commissioning uh, the water project in that school. So. Uh, our major aim is now to, to look at the various methods that are, are feasible uh, 
user friendly cost effective that can make this water safe for human consumption and uh, uh, that gives a background to uh, the topic for our discussion today about safe water supply so everyone would wish to have safe water for various uh, reasons so um, Okay. Yeah. Uh, looking at a, at a, this safe water supply, uh, by end of this session, uh, one should be able to to relate water and disease, or water and disease transmission, because there are quite a number of these various categories of diseases that, that, that spread uh, with the aid of, of water, ranging from those that uh, uh, harbor a pathogen, ranging from water harboring the pathogens that cause these diseases, harboring the, the uh, uh, vectors, uh, and many others. We shall look at uh, the various uh, categories also of diseases, including waterborne, water washed, uh, water based, and water related, and how these uh, can be prevented. Uh, then one needs to also, by end of this session, be able to describe the various water sources. Uh, this objective three, I think, uh, we could just brainstorm about it. Uh, because the, the various water sources are common to us. Uh, safe water provision criteria and the various uh, water treatment uh, methods. So uh, to relate water and disease, First of all, I would want to uh, begin by saying that water is essential for life. And uh, water being essential for life, uh, I would request that everyone is uh, who is here be able to mention at least one uh, essential use of water in life. Hmm? Let's, let's mention these uh, uses of water. But by, by just show of hands. Okay, uh, doctor, water can be used for transport, washing. Trans okay. Washing, transport, Jen, then Kenneth, I see their hands are up. Water can be used during agricultural farming as uh, like for irrigation. Farming, perfect. Uh -huh. Kenneth? Yes. Water is, uh, can be essential during construction. Construction, I read from the chat from uh, Esther for drinking, food preparation, washing. Water is, uh, is, 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 is a medium of, of transport, consists of the uh, largest percentage of, of the body fluids. So basically water is essential for life. Uh, industrial use, to mention, but a few. So with the uh, hydrating the body, and uh, if I ask the question, you, you'd realize that uh, by this time, 
uh, almost everyone who is with us on the call has at least uh, drank some water, has used water in one way or the other. So human life can hardly exist uh, without water. Therefore, adequate, safe, and accessible water supply must be made available to all people. And this would call it uh, being satisfactory. If, if, if water is adequate, is safe and accessible, then that uh, means it, it satisfies human needs. We shall look at this uh, safe water criteria in those three parameters of adequate uh, safety and accessibility, uh, which makes uh, water satisfactory. However, water is one of the factors that contribute to disease transmission. Uh, when uh, it doesn't meet uh, the safety criteria. Uh, satisfactory water supply must be made available to all humans if, uh, if disease transmission is to, to be prevented. And improving access to safe water for drinking alone uh, can result in tangible benefits to health. So everyone, uh, uh, so every effort should be made to achieve uh, drinking water quality that is safe, as practical uh, as possible. So uh, to to shed more light, you realize that uh, water is on both sides. It is essential for, for human life and human life cannot exist uh, in absence of water, but also absence, a, a presence of water can, can be dangerous to human health. Uh, one in, in a aiding disease transmission, which we shall look at in more details, look at the various categories of, of, of diseases that spread through water. Uh, but also uh, water itself can be disaster and lead to death, uh, especially uh, in, uh, if, if, if water contributes to man, made or, or natural disasters like flooding. Thank you, Esther. The uh, floods can be a source of, of harm uh, physically to people, disp displace these people to, to uh, internally displaced camps. And, and, and usually with, with such man-made or natural disasters that are related to water. Uh, water quality reduces, congestion increases, and this accelerates uh, the transmission of disease. Uh, are still trying to relate water and diseases, the great majority of water-related health problems as a result of microbial uh, Yes, so, so microorganisms uh, such as bacteria, uh, viruses, 
uh, and protozoa are a major cause of these water related health problems. Uh, of course, uh, as well as the uh, other forms of, of biological and chemical contamination. Infectious diseases such as the diarrhea, typhoid, are uh, among uh, the leading causes of death and illness uh, are especially uh, in, in the developing world. Uh, the, developing, the developed world has uh, moved beyond this, uh, especially uh, from the time of, you know, of industrial revolution. Uh, but prior to uh, industrial revolution, uh, developed countries equally faced uh, similar challenges due to uh, water supply problems. Uh, from your epidemiology classes, you, you, you must have read about cholera outbreaks uh, that used to sweep uh, across London in 18, uh, 1840, 1850s. And uh, from the, the work of, of, of John Snow that has been documented, uh, John Snow was able to uh, document the relationship between cholera outbreaks and water supply. So there are many other uh, diseases that are associated with water, and these can be classified as waterborne, water washed, water based, and water related diseases. Uh, yes, Kenneth, your hand is up. Kenneth? No, it was actually an old hand, sir. Sorry about that. It is an old hand. Good. No problem. Sorry about that. Doreen, you are most welcome. Doreen? Uh, are you with us or you connected and uh, ran out from the device? Maybe she did connect and, and, and moved uh, close, sorry, far from uh, her device. So let's. Uh, uh, briefly talk about this uh, water-related health problems, uh, category by category. So waterborne diseases are uh, being the first category of, of disease that are associated with water. Uh, these are caused by ingestion, uh, uh, of water that is contaminated by humans or animal uh, excrement that contains pathogenic uh, microorganisms. So the root of transmission for, for this is by drinking and this, this means uh, the spread, the, the, the transmission is, is fecal oral uh, once someone drinks water that is contaminated with, with these pathogens, they are able to multiply and eventually cause disease. Uh, the word waterborne diseases has for long been used as a blanket word to refer to all diseases that are associated with water, uh, but away from this, as you move away from this class, uh, you should be able to differentiate uh, between these uh, various categories. So characteristically waterborne diseases are caused uh, by ingestion of, of contaminated water. 
Uh, these include enteric uh, and diarrheal diseases caused by bacteria, uh, those caused by viruses, including cholera typhoid, uh, bacterial dysentery. Uh, diseases also caused by protozoa, uh, such as giardiasis and, and amoebic dysentery, uh, categorized under uh, uh, water borne diseases. Then uh, the water washed, which is also another category. As the name uh, uh, reads and suggests, these diseases are caused by lack of water, basically. And in times of scarcity, there is poor personal hygiene, skin, and eye contact with contaminated water is possible. And uh, these diseases are sometimes also known as water scarce diseases because they occur when there isn't enough water available for personal washing uh, include scabies uh, trachoma scabies affect so much the, the eyes sorry the skin trachoma the eyes uh, typhus fever uh, and uh, usually with the poor personal hygiene, uh, things like freeze, lice, uh, and tick bone diseases uh, will eventually manifest. Uh, we may not see so much of these uh, water washed diseases at the in the in the in the current situation, but in places where water is scarce, uh, then these ones uh, will, will appear. So uh, this basically means that there is a poor personal hygiene. Uh, I, I don't know, do we have people who, who have seen lice? and freeze of recent. No. Yeah, so this, uh, this may not be common, but uh, once you see them, then, uh, you know that the, the uh, cause is basically lack of enough water for personal hygiene. Yes, Stuart says they are freeze in dogs. Yeah, so these these freeze in dogs and other animals, including cattle and other forms of livestock, also have uh, given a chance. They can attack humans and. Uh, and of course, will eventually lead to what we are talking about. But in an event uh, that uh, enough water is made available, uh, these diseases are prevented. Then we also have water-based uh, diseases. Uh, these are caused by parasites that spend part of their life cycle in water. So these uh, parasites have their intermediate hosts. 
in water and uh, uh, they eventually gain uh, entry into uh, human body system through uh, contact uh, when, when, when humans get in contact with uh, these waters, uh, especially through openings on, 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 the, on the skin, and they include uh, uh, birhazia, which is caused by uh, a worm that spends part of its life cycle in, in water snails. So people can become infected uh, when swimming in infected water. Uh, the guinea worm transmitted by uh, drinking water that is contaminated with uh, the larvae of, of this guinea worm. Well, this doesn't qualify uh, guinea worm to be waterborne since uh, the uh, the worm spends part of the of its life cycle uh, in water, and the the most active being the larvae stage, which is responsible for cause causation of, of the disease. And then finally, uh, we have water related diseases. Uh, whose vectors uh, such as mosquitoes, uh, tessifries, uh, black flies and others breed or feed near water. So the relationship between water is, the, is that vectors of, of these diseases uh, find it favorable to, to breed or feed near water. Uh, they are not typically associated with lack of, of access to clean water like uh, the case is for waterborne uh, and water-based as well as water-related. Uh, they include dengue, fever, Phryalysis, malaria, onchocerciasis, or river blindness, trypanosomiasis, are spread by thesiphrys, uh, as well as yellow fever. So this uh, shows us the relationship between water and disease. Uh, the control for, for these uh, water-related diseases is, is uh, simple, and this simply includes destruction of these vectors uh, so that uh, the breeding cycle uh, is broken. So with that, this uh, uh, will enable us to relate water with disease and, uh, and know that the water can be an agent of disease transmission in, in several ways. One, by harboring the, the, the pathogens themselves. Uh, when water scarcity heats, harboring uh, intermediate hosts of diseases, as well as uh, providing conducive environment for feeding and breeding uh, of disease transmitting vectors. Any questions uh, relating to the categories of water related diseases? Hello. 
Yes, please. Yes, uh, are we still uh, on the same page? Yes. yes, we are. Okay. Yeah, so if there is no uh, questions, away from the microbial uh, related Okay, so there is a there is a question in the chat box. Uh, where does Ebola fall in these uh, four categories of, of, of water related diseases? Uh, Eston, you could uh, respond to that. Where does Ebola fall? Hello? Yes. This is Asiki. Uh, when you look at Ebola, Ebola, the way I'm thinking, is not linked to anything related to water. Otherwise, uh, when you look at the uh, uh, it is most related to maybe uh, uh, animals and the birds, things like uh, the chimpanzees and the, the birds and so on. So to me, I don't think there's any link between uh, Ebola and water. All right, thank you very much, Asiki. Uh, looking at the, uh, the disease transmission dynamics in relation to Ebola, you realize that the host for Ebola virus disease are uh, animals, uh, which when uh, man get in contact with, there is that spread and the contact range from touch to consumption by feeding on them. Uh, the, the relationship between Ebola and, and water is that uh, Water, sorry, Ebola being a, a contact disease, since it can be transmitted by contact, personal hygiene, including hand washing, uh, reduces the risk in case uh, an, a, a person uh, got in contact with an Ebola patient or their belongings. So there is some relationship with water, but we can't uh, categorize it uh, under any of these uh, four categories. Hope, uh, uh, Eston, uh, your question is answered. Yeah, somehow, though, uh, not fully contented. Yes. So uh, what makes you not to be fully contented? Where would you want us to categorize Ebola uh, um, among these? Um, probably. Water washed. Water washed. Yeah. So in an event that there is a uh, scarcity of water and there is no contact with uh, uh, the hosts for Ebola virus disease, then spread of, of, of Ebola won't be possible. So the only link between a, 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 a Ebola and water is about contact. And the, by personal hygiene, contact uh, with the with the Ebola virus can uh, the, the chain can be broken so we can't easily categorize it under water washed you have uh, you have no water but you are not in touch with any of the of these chimpanzees bats and uh, and other forms of birds okay okay sir all right. 
Uh, so apart from the microbial uh, contamination of water that result in diseases that we have just looked at, uh, chemical contamination can also be uh, a potential cause of ill health, uh, whereby water may contain chemicals as such a, a, as minerals. These may be naturally occurring. Uh, others may be uh, may be added to the water supply ch chain by human activities. Some of these chemicals are are very important for health, uh, such as fluoride, which is a, a component of most toothpaste, and uh, it provides uh, hardening properties for the teeth. But in a, in large quantities where it is available in drinking water can uh, can affect the same teeth so uh, these other diseases that uh, all these chemical health problems uh, are also classified as waterborne diseases now on the extreme Uh, lower right corner of, of the slide, there is a, a, a picture that speaks to this, and this uh, shows teeth affected by fluorides. Uh, has anyone seen? people whose teeth have been affected by fluoride. Yes. Mm. At least I've seen some from the um, area of Fort Porto. Okay. So this teeth uh, decoration is as a result of, of natural occurring fluoride in water there, there is a there is a stream uh, I would want to call it a river a small a small river in in one of the areas around the Pinyanga Ruim as you cross to Kasesi. So people from uh, around there have such problems uh, but there are quite a, a number of other health problems such as lead poisoning if, if lead leaks into water um, if you look at the, the current uh, national water and sewerage cooperation lines as opposed to the past most of the pipe lines are plastic and uh, these have replaced the metallic or the lead containing pipes uh, given the, the kind of reaction that takes place between water and, and the lead. That some studies have found uh, traces of lead in, in drinking water. So now uh, most of the, of the pipe work is done with the uh, plastic rather than the metallic. And uh, if metals are to be used, uh, then lead-free metals are used. Okay. So now let's uh, get to our objective three, sorry, objective two, having 
looked at the relationship between water and disease, how water facilitates disease occurrence and how these water uh, related health problems can be uh, prevented. Let's talk about safe water because this would be the ultimate goal. Everyone would want to have safe water, but what, uh, what is safe water? Maria Mwapio, what, what would you call safe water? Mariam, please unmute. Mariam, it is so unfortunate that you are breaking a lot and we are unable to hear you. Maybe let's hear from Derek. Uh, let's please. Yes, Derek, what would you uh, regard safe water to be? All right, thank you very much, Derek. Uh, thank you also, uh, Jane and Vicky and Richard for uh, what you've posted in the chat. So by talking about uh, safe water, uh, one would, uh, would, would immediately think about water that is free from disease causing organisms. Uh, and does not have any significant risk to health if consumed over a lifetime. Uh, the fact that uh, water is essential for life, water consumption is, uh, is on a daily basis. So, This water uh, uh, also usually come from a same source and people may have a, a, a same source of water over a long time. Therefore, it means the lifetime consumption is possible if there is no change of residence or the, 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 the people remain in one place. So, uh, for us to regard water as safe, it first of all should be portable. And by portability, we mean that water is safe for drinking, meaning it doesn't contain uh, microorganisms, doesn't contain uh, chemicals, which makes it unsafe for drinking. But also water should be palatable. Uh, palatability, uh, this uh, is much used when we talk about water that is to be consumed or drunk. Uh, should be at a, a desirable temperature like uh, it may not be possible for you to drink too hot 
water at, at boiling point and water at, also at, at freezing point may not be uh, easy to drink. Well, water may be portable, but it may, may not be palatable. Completely transparent. Uh, if you remember where well, we looked at uh, the properties of water, the physical properties of water in our early classes of science, that water that is colorless, when we talk about the transparency, free from tests, and uh, this would differentiate salty and uh, from from the non-salty water. Odors. Uh, odors usually suggest uh, microbial activity, meaning there is uh, some uh, organisms that uh, are dead and they and, and, uh, are uh, uh, rotting in water color. Uh, color can be due to chemicals, can be due to also physical contamination with soil and any other uh, waste materials. So, uh, palatable water may also not be necessarily uh, Portable. For example, uh, most of us have uh, tap stands. When you open your tap stand on a good day, water will be colorless. No smell if they have not just added uh, chlorine, no test ETC. Uh, but if uh, microbial examination is done, you may find disease causing organisms. So portability of water should also should not be uh, misinterpreted for palatability. Altogether. True. Sure. Okay. Yeah, so safe water, uh, safe drinking water is suitable for all usual domestic purposes, including personal hygiene. We already uh, mentioned some of these uh, purposes water is used for. And access to safe and affordable water is considered the basic human right. Uh, if you remember very well in our uh, in our very first session, we talked about sustainable development. And uh, this is in line with sustainable development goal number six. Okay, you see. Uh, Julia Soporot, what does the sustainable development goal number six talk about? Julius? Oh, Julius is not with us. What happened? Can we hear from Vicky? Vicky, are you with us? Yes, sir. I'm here. Okay. What does the sustainable development goal number six say? Julia, Julia says he's in a noisy place. Yeah, but Julius, you're also free to type in the chat.
Vicky? Let me help Vicky if she's uh, maybe still not in. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Yeah, this is it. Uh, it says that I ensure access to water and sanitation for all. All right. So ensure access to water and sanitation for all. And that's a uh, goal number uh, six. And it has several uh, targets that should be achieved. Uh, if sustainable development is to be achieved, ranging from affordable drinking water, ending open defecation, providing access to sanitation, improving water quality, wastewater treatment, and many others, to mention just but a few. Uh, yeah, so this. Uh, Water and sanitation for all. I would encourage you uh, guys to, to be well versed with these sustainable development goals because they are all pointing to health and uh, our role is health promotion. So at least uh, have them on your fingertips. They are not very many, they are, they are simply 18. Uh, despite uh, progress that has been made, as you may have uh, seen from various reports, I don't know whether there are some people who, uh, who managed to interact with uh, uh, the district leaders uh, following that assignment that we had. Uh, despite several progresses, that have been made towards achieving this safe water and sanitation for all, uh, 2 billion, 2.1 billion of the, of the world's population, that's a quarter or, or more than a quarter, uh, still lack safe water access at their homes. So, uh, in this, there is need uh, that they addressing ch challenges of these sustainable development goals uh, require that we shift our, our line of thinking, we shift uh, the practice uh, from regarding water just as a, as a natural resource uh, that should be managed and used to regarding what as a fundamental human right uh, to which all people are entitled without discrimination. So the current practice is that water should be managed as a, as a natural resource but uh, there is a need that we shift that uh, thinking and, uh, and we start regarding what as a, as a human right. That's uh, when uh, tangible progress can be made towards achieving the UN Sustainable Development Goal number six. There is a colleague who is almost uh, breaking our ears. It's okay, I've muted him. All right. Uh, so they always help us to do mute some of these uh, uh, colleagues. They, they can unmute accidentally. Uh, we had also agreed that you would do an, a heavy pass, uh, record some of these sessions as we move on. But I don't know what happened. Maybe did your gadget run out of 
uh, the storage. No, I recorded them. I'm going to be uploading them soon together with this one up today. So we are sure there is a recording in progress. Yes, it's already yes, it's already there. Hmm. Go to upload it and then share the link to the class. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, I don't see it on my side that it's being recorded, but nonetheless, let's proceed. So, uh, for us to... My side is showing that it's recorded. I don't know about other guys. Okay, that's fine. Now you're recording. That, that's, that's very fine. Uh, let's uh, also briefly talk about uh, water sources uh, because if the aim is to use water, it being a fundamental human right, uh, have it safe, one needs to know uh, how water contamination happens and this can only be known uh, if we talk about the water sources. Uh, so water source, when we talk about water source, uh, we mean uh, water in its natural environment. Uh, the group that presented to us about water resources uh, did mention this. So water in its natural environment, uh, we are, here we are looking at uh, this source and the water in it that can be used by people to meet their needs. Uh, we already talked about those needs. Common sources of water range from uh, underground Uh, underground water uh, that is uh, to say uh, that water is beneath the ground surface uh, water uh, that is above the earth's surface. Uh, underground water can be also accessed uh, by drilling into the earth is crust and reaching the water table. Uh, the water table varies from one place to another, uh, depending on, on where you are. Uh, water table on a hill may be far uh, compared to water table on a, on a, a low land and compared to the water table in the swamp. So depending on, on, on the location, uh, if there is any form of, of, of drilling or cut into the earth's crust, underground water can also be accessed. For that surface water is readily accessed, uh, in form of rivers, lakes, uh, water springs, rainwater, etc. Uh, so these water sources can be categorized as either protected or not protected. And uh, the unprotected ones, uh, where they, there is a, no barrier or structure to protect water from contamination as opposed to those uh, where there is a structure uh, that prevents uh, water pollution or water contamination. So protected sources on the other hand have a cover and this cover can be by use of, of stone, work, cement or any other material uh, that prevent the entry of physical, chemical, and, and, and biological contaminants. So uh, all surface water uh, 
if there is no no cover or there is no protection is is called unprotected water a uh, protected the water of course uh, is likely to be safer to drink uh, than the the unprotected since uh, the unprotected water sources can be polluted contaminated very easily as there is no barrier uh, these terms can also be used uh, to refer to water sources improved and unimproved for protected and, and the unprotected respectively so you could do uh, uh, by looking at, at at communities from which you come uh, you can easily tell whether uh, your communities get water from protected or from unprotected sources so uh, we, we have already talked about the uses of water uh, but uh, we could also talk about uh, the hydrological cycle or the water cycle uh, and i will request narongo to unmute and uh, tell us about the water cycle narongo in a, in a few words Can I ask Stuart to take us through? So I'm going to disorganize it. All right. Your delegate is Stuart. Yes, went through it together. Let him tell us. Okay. Stuart, please go ahead. As if Stuart is also not around. Uh, doctor, doctor, can I explain a bit? Please go ahead. Yeah, looking at the cycle of uh, water, uh, it first starts with the evaporation. Like, for example, in lakes, uh, looking at the, 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 the trees, the forests, because in the forest there is that evaporation. All these evaporations actually happens uh, during a specific time. They evaporate and as they evaporate, they go and form clouds. When they form clouds, uh, the rain falls. So when it falls, it still come back and uh, uh, it fills the lakes, the rivers, and of course, still uh, the forest also takes some water as the, and the cycle continues like that until, until of course, it continues rotating like that. Thank you. That is the, uh, that is the, uh, that is my submission. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Amos. That's a, well said. Uh, so this hydrological water cycle simply involves continuous saturation of water between the earth and the atmosphere. And uh, as uh,
Azamos says a uh, key important process is that keep land moisture in constant motion between uh, the earth's surface and the atmosphere include evaporation. Evaporation is a change of water from uh, liquid to gaseous state. And this evaporation can come from uh, open water sources, transpiration, which is from plants, uh, vapor uh, moving from plants. So, of course, the fact that these uh, now water changes into gaseous state, uh, it means uh, it will eventually ascend into the atmosphere where condensation takes place. After condensation, uh, the water that was initially in gaseous state uh, changes back into liquid state and its liquid state is heavier and cannot keep in constant motion in the atmosphere. So there is uh, that precipitation which comes in form of rainfall back to the earth's crust uh, surface and eventually runoff uh, uh, to surface water bodies, some water uh, will, will be utilized by plants as it, as it sinks into the soil, but others, uh, other uh, am amounts of water will percolate through this, the soil, uh, of course, depending on uh, the topography of the area, uh, back to the uh, open sources as well as the underground water sources. So briefly, that is how the uh, water cycle could be explained from evaporation to condensation and back as rain. Uh, that we, we may not take a lot of time. I see people have posted quite a number of, of descriptions of how they understand the water cycle and they all speak to that range of events from evaporation to precipitation and runoff. Uh, so I uh, would do also in your free time read about uh, sources of water contamination and how water can be protected from contamination. There are various sources uh, that uh, lead to water contamination. Some uh, man made or, or, or human activities and others uh, natural. So in your free time, please ensure that you read and uh, make some notes for your own self uh, for purposes of reading and understanding. Um, our other objective for this session was to uh, enable us to describe the safe water criteria or the satisfactory water. And uh, we already talked about satisfactory water as being uh, available. That is, first of all, is water available? In, in sufficient amounts, safe to drink, and is accessible. Uh, we also said uh, human beings have a right to clean and safe water as, as spelled out in the Sustainable Development Goals, especially number six. 
several uh, criteria need to be satisfied to ensure that the people in, in, in your community or in, in any given community have satisfactory access to water. And this uh, range from sufficient quantity according to international and national guidelines, uh, the quantity of water available for each household ranges from about 50 to 100 liters per person per day, or an absolute minimum of 20 liters. So if, if any household or if any uh, person cannot have 20 liters per day, then I would regard that person as, as to, to, to be living in, an, in a, a water insufficient situation. Uh, in practice, the amount of, of water, of course, collected every day by household is considerably less uh, than they mentioned the quantity. And this is largely determined by distance from the water source. Uh, the closer the distance, uh, the more water the, the household will have access to. And then the longer the distance, the less the water that this household will have access to. So if uh, water is outside the home, but within a one kilometer distance, meaning that the total collection time to and from the water sources are around 30 minutes. About 20 liters per person per day can, can typically be collected. So where the, the distance is longer than a kilometer, uh, that means the total collection time will also increase and uh, And of course, we can't uh, meet the first criteria. Uh, Flavia, what is your experience with uh, this sufficient quantity in the in the community where, where you currently live? In the community I live, actually, it is not sufficient because water is always on and off. Okay, so water is always on and off, despite it being in a shorter distance, but uh, uh, the amount of water that can be readily available for use per person may be less. Safe and acceptable whereby water is uh, safe for drinking and other household uh, uses, free from microbes, parasites, free from chemicals, and uh, any physical contaminant that may constitute a danger to the person's health. We already talked about palatability. Uh, the acceptable order and color that fits in, in the safe and acceptable criteria. Physical access, which ranges from no access to optimal access. Uh, and this looks at how reachable or how near is the water source from the household, the school, the facility, etc. No access water in more than one kilometer. The total correction time uh, greater than 20, 30 minutes. Basic access water within one kilometer. Immediate access, sorry, intermediate access water is provided on site uh, through at, uh, at least one tap 
uh, at a yard level on average that the volume of water collected of course is approximately 50 liters per, per person per day and then looked more access uh, supply of, of water is through multiple taps uh, within a house and approximately 100 to 200 liters per person could, could be available or more. So people with the one tap stand in their homes are considered to be intermediate access, but those with multiple taps in the bathroom, in the kitchen, in the compound, in the sitting room at the sink, ETC, are considered optimal access. And then affordable, as we say that water uh, is a human right, uh, other than being physical access, but water should be also be reasonably priced and affordable for everyone. Uh, meaning that uh, the cost of water should not interfere with the person's capacity to afford uh, other essential goods and other basic needs. Uh, of course, this would uh, uh, also look at the uh, essential amounts of water being sometimes provided free, according, of course, the social economic st strength of the communities. So ideally, uh, this water should be free, and in most communities, people can access this water from natural sources as well as artificial sources free through government and implementing partners initiatives such as protected springs and boreholes or, or protected wells. So ensuring affordability of water requires that service match what people can pay. Uh, at the moment, uh, 20 liters of water range from 100 to around 500 in most towns. And uh, that would mean that an average of, of about five to, to five shillings is used to buy each, each, each liter of water. But in some places, uh, water is hard to afford and goes even beyond 1,000. So as we say that in most of our rural communities in, in the country, protected water sources are provided free by government and, and other institutions. So this means uh, people can walk to the water source and, and, and collect water free. But this does not uh, necessarily mean that affordable water is physically accessible, is safe, and, and they can also be uh, sufficient. Yeah, so I have some few questions that uh, one would uh, be asked to ponder about what are some of the vulnerable groups of people uh, due to lack of satisfactory water provision and how do you rate your local community's access to water yeah, in terms of basic uh, no access, intermediate and optimal access. Uh, we already heard from one of the members and, and he says uh, water, I, I think her description would be 
and maybe intermediate, I don't know. So, uh, Evelyn, Evelyn, uh, what would be your response to these uh, two questions? Yurin, are you with us? Oh, Yurin is not. Yes, sir. All right. So, but I'm in a, a noisy place. Though. All right. Nalong has her hand up and she would want her to share with us. Yes. Uh, so, I was breastfeeding. So. <laughs> but, um, uh, for my community, I have three communities. So I'll talk about the community where I'm born. Um, I would say intermediate access. Reason is that um, one, they have uh, access to uh, um, the national water. So the, the homes were connected to national water. But before National Water, there was also another program of rainwater harvesting. So some people had uh, built uh, rainwater harvesting tanks. And then they also have, they still have some of the families still have their traditional uh, shallow wells or unprotected wells. But also there are springs that some program had brought some time back and some boreholes within that same community. So I am saying intermediate access. And depending on uh, the capacity of the family, some families still use like shallow wells, others use boreholes, especially those that are close to the boreholes and, uh, and the springs that were constructed by the sub-county. And recent, when they provided the national water in the, in the village, um, still some people also can access national water depending on the economic status. Yes, that's what I can say. Yeah, all right. Thank you very much uh, for sharing that uh, experience with us. So uh, you realize that depending on, on the social economic status, some people have access to natural sources of water or, or other uh, protected sources. Uh, some have harvested some rain water. Others have uh, connection to the National Water and Sewerage Corporation lines. So uh, now it would be okay to rate access to water in, in her village as generally intermediate, since these people can access water in, in their homes, most of them. So the, uh, people have also posted in, in the chat about the vulnerable categories of people. Uh, these include the disabled, those in, in water scarce areas, uh, those that are, that, that are old and access is limited by uh, their age. People who are forced to migrate, forced migrants, especially uh, those ones in uh, that are uh, in, in, in this displaced uh, settlements and many others. So this one as, uh, as of course you go through this module, it is, uh, it is good to also reflect 
at communities you, you live in, communities you, you serve, uh, so that uh, initiatives to improve uh, access to, to water be made. Okay, so uh, that gives a, a general introduction to water, relating water to disease, as well as uh, water safety uh, when it comes to what we should consider as safe water. Looking at those four criteria of sufficient, uh, of uh, safe and uh, unacceptable, uh, affordable, etc. So, since uh, water is is liable to contamination, and uh, even though it existed naturally without contamination, it would uh, contain a natural uh, contaminants, including chemicals, uh, uh, as well as uh, living organisms, because these may include plants, may include animals uh, that uh, eventually get access into the water sources. There is need that this water be treated before it is used for human consumption or any other uh, purposes. And the, the session we are moving to, we should be able to look at the, the various methods of water treatment. And, and, and these range from community water treatment methods this that can be done at even a level of the household to large scale uh, water treatment methods, uh, especially for municipal water treatment. So the various uh, methods of water treatment at household level of water purification will be looked at. Uh, uh, this, uh, the, the steps involved in water treatment at municipal level will also be talked about. Then key in water treatment uh, is filtration. Uh, as this filtration is important in removal of both physical uh, contaminants, some of the filters help in reducing the microorganisms load in the uh, in the water, and uh, chemicals, especially which cause a uh, coloration of water. So. Uh, water filtration techniques will also be looked at in this session. Um, from the very beginning, we uh, we have been talking about how important water is and uh, water has and still plays an important role in human uh, civilization, in human development. It, it was and it continues to be needed for drinking, uh, food preparation, cleaning, irrigation, uh, among other various uses. Uh, therefore, having ready access to water uh, is always important. And we already talked about 
uh, access. When we talk about access, what we mean? There are those who have no access and there are those who have optimal access. However, water sources used for supplying this water are not always clean. Uh, therefore, this purification or this treatment uh, for drinking water uh, aims at uh, improving its portability as well as palatability, improving smell and taste, removing microorganisms, and the of course, this has been necessary throughout human history and continues to be necessary. Yeah. Thank you, Asiki, for, uh, for the chat uh, about some of the methods which we shall look at uh, in, in our subsequent slides in details. There is no single and reliable water treatment method as suitable for small communities water supply and the preventing water from getting dirty uh, is easier than having to cleaning it up having to clean it afterwards so uh in, in your free time that's why I, I told you to read about water source protection if water sources were prevented from uh, contamination uh, the cost of its purification would drastically reduce. Uh, however, there are many, of course, occasions when relatively dirty water has to be used. And sometimes even when we protect our water sources, we can't avoid contamination. Uh, since we are saying that contamination can uh, be both natural as well as uh, from human activity. And therefore, to avoid disease, we, we already have talked about these disease categories from water completely. Uh, we must treat water before it is used uh, for human consumption. That's why we would look at uh, these uh, methods of water treatment uh, at community level. Uh, one of them is boiling, and uh, at least everyone knows uh, about boiling. Using any form of heat uh, to boil water up to the boiling point, which is usually around uh, 100 degrees C. Uh, by boiling, most of the microorganisms will, will, will die at, at, at the, that boiling point. Uh, however, water cannot be uh, used, cannot be drunk at, at boiling point. So water has to be allowed to cool and stored in clean containers. Though water can also be contaminated even after boiling, if uh, hand hygiene is not ensured, uh, if that containers are used, that a cup size to draw water from, from the storage container. Uh, this contamination can, can, however, be avoided. Uh, if water is served in a jar or a cup and, and, and it, it, it is safer to use a, a, a vessel which is fitted with a lid uh, and has a tap for storage. I think. Uh, 
right, so I have this typo. It should be the word lead, not lead. So this is basically about boiling, using heat. Away from using heat, storage uh, can also be used to uh, improve water quality. When water is stored, all particles, of course, and microorganisms present uh, will settle at the bottom of the storage container and, and uh, they can be powered away if uh, the water that is clean is powered off fast. Uh, this, of course, this is uh, basically decanting. So if we allow the water to stand, many microorganisms which may be in it can also die because they cannot survive in water for a long time. This allows uh, also some silt uh, to settle down using a, a three pot, three water pots can do this. Uh, we have an illustration of the, of the three pot system whereby on each day, as illustrated in, in, in the diagram on, on your right, uh, water is, is, is of, of course brought to the house. So really power water stored in, in the port two to port three, wash port two. So really power water in, in port one to port two and wash port. Uh, one, uh, by the time uh, water is moved from uh, port one to three, uh, as you can see uh, the illustrations, uh, the, the smell, the, the color, and the taste will have improved, as well as the microorganisms load will also have uh, been improved. So you may wish to strain it using a, a strainer, a clean uh, piece of cloth. And drinking water should always be taken from uh, port three. Uh, to ensure this, uh, this water uh, has to be stored for at least two days. Uh, however, this may not be guaranteed that uh, water is completely free from microorganisms. So in addition to the three pot system, we may have uh, killed uh, some microorganisms, but others may survive up to pot three. So in addition to this, uh, this water can also be boiled. Uh, to ensure that it is completely safe. Uh, someone posted in the chat a question, how safe is it? So the safety uh, cannot be guaranteed since there is no measure of, uh, of, of, of the microorganisms load, but uh, if we read this bullet too, if water is allowed to stand, many of the microorganisms that are harmful in it may die since they cannot survive in water for a long time. Uh, hence, another uh, method uh, for treatment that especially aims at uh, at killing the microorganisms uh, can also be used in uh, in addition to this. But in an event uh, that this is the only available, drinking water should be taken from port three. Uh, we have uh, other methods like uh, sedimentation. Uh, this is a, 
majorly used in large scale water treatment, uh, whereby water is allowed to settle. Uh, and uh, the foreign material would settle down for easy removal. However much uh, this method improves the color of the water, it doesn't kill organisms. Uh, the procedure is that you allow water to stand in a container uh, so that the solid particles and impurities settle at the bottom of, of, of the water. And the decanting can be done to power off the, uh, uh, the, the water that is uh, relatively clean. Coagulant uh, chemicals can also be used, such as aluminium sulfate, as these uh, increase at the rate at which these particles will settle down as the particles will bind to them. So this is a, a, a little different from the, the previous, whereby this only uses only one container. And in the previous, three containers are, are used. Uh, for large communities, small sedimentation tanks can be built, although it is not usually possible to arrange for coagulant chemicals uh, to be added to assist water sedimentation. It does not remove harmful uh, organisms from polluted water, but it helps to clarify uh, water. So, uh, in large scale uh, water treatment, especially at this level, uh, these would be called clarifiers or sedimentation tanks. So in addition to sedimentation, uh, treatment by filtration and chlorination may be necessary. For sedimentation to work better, uh, there must be horizontal flow into the tank where water moves from one end to the other. So as it moves from one end to the other, uh, that circular movement allows uh, the, the particles to settle uh, at the bottom of the tank of the container. Uh, Paul is saying that the screen is not shared. Please, uh, colleagues, confirm that you are able to see uh, my screen. The screen is visible. With the heading water treatment method three. It's clear. Or you could refresh so that you are able to get the screen. So another method is the filtration whereby water is uh, made to go through a filter. Uh, and this filter uh, is simply a medium uh, or a material that has the ability to, to make water percolate through. So, uh, filtration can, uh, of course, eliminate some microorganisms from the water and also uh, eliminate the large 
uh, particles. A simple cross filtration uh, removes both fine and heavy suspended particles uh, in the water, improves color, but does not kill germs. So those who uh, could have gr grown up in rural settings, uh, we used this simple cross filtration several times as we come from uh, water sources because of the distance. Sometimes you, you, you get tired and, and you are thirsty, but the, the water is uh, no, no, not as one would desire. So we, we used to put the part of, 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 of the cross that you are putting on, you cover it on the, uh, on the, on the jerry can and, and drink, press a cross uh, over a clean container and pour water into that container. That would be a modernized one. Uh, strainers can also be used to remove these particles. But important to note is that filtration does not render water uh, safe uh, for, for drinking, but rather improves smell and, and, and color. So it is important, it is an important, of course, uh, treatment process through which uh, some bacteria can be removed from the water, those that uh, uh, large enough, and uh, using sand filters or small home filters, these bacteria can be removed. Uh, sand filtration is also used in, in municipal water treatment. Uh, microorganisms are either removed uh, physically uh, especially in a, in a rapid sand filter, which we shall uh, see when we come to municipal water treatment, uh, or as a result of, uh, of microbial growth, uh, if it is a slow sand filter. Uh, this filtration can also be done at home or on a large scale for a village or a town. Uh, this, uh, the best Simple example of home, sun, uh, home filter, a kind of filters. Uh, though these are at a cost. Uh, the filter is basically made of, uh, of pottery in the shape of a candle. Uh, so this clay, uh, when we go back to uh, the properties of, of soil. Clay has a high water retention capacity because its particles uh, are so fine and uh, are too packed and close to one another. So it does not allow uh, a correlation of, of, of water uh, very quickly. So the porosity of, of, of clay is very low. Uh, uh, the, on, on, on this left side, the brown, uh, the brown doom shaped candle is made of clay, uh, fitted in a container, uh, but with the, also fitted with uh, an exit through which water can percolate and then contaminated water will slowly uh, percolate through this candle and can be corrected uh, in, the, in, a, in, a, in another container that is pressed below. Uh, these uh, uh, ceramic candle filters are currently on the market and uh, uh, the principle is that uh, water simply percolates through uh, the clay and uh, most of the microorganisms 
uh, are removed. As well as uh, as the color. Uh, do we have people who have uh, uh, seen these uh, sand filters on market? The, the clay kind of filters. Hello, anyone who has seen a kind of filter or even they have it at their home? Yes, e Esther says it is distributed by Living Goods Uganda and maybe Esther could have seen it. Esther, would you kindly share with with the Ruth about how this filter looks like? You know, this is ceramic water filters. By the time I was working with living goods, we used to emphasize and even sensitize the community and mostly the VHTs that they can even go ahead and say community to use these water filters, just draw water from anywhere or like a water source, put in this ceramic Pot because it has a ceramic wall, a ceiling within the, the, the clay. So when the water settles within or inside the pot, it filters, then later it will just maybe come out and then it collected in the drum, it can be drum or a bucket where it fits. Then later I use it up just for drawing the water for drinking. That's how we used to tell them to illustrate the community. But it was yeah. safe and we also Second data yeah, thank you very much, Esther. Uh, microbial tests on water through ceramic candle filters uh, have shown that this water uh, is safe for drinking and and it, they are being promoted, though this may be a little costly uh, if we go back to the social economic uh, status of the individuals. So this uh, slide simply explains how this uh, water uh, filter, or the kind of filter uh, works, made up of a hollow cylinder. One end is closed and the other is open fitted with uh, a watertight joint uh, to a metal which carries uh, a metal nozzle communicating with at the interior of the filter or communicating with the with the clay. This filter is then mounted on a container like an open uh, cylinder on one end, completely closed and screwed. So water is powered around the candle and water will make its way uh, through the interior of the candle and it comes out through the, the nozzle. So uh, the inside, of the of the candle would uh, ideally look like this, but of course when you look at it uh, from this side, these are simple buckets. But uh, what filters uh, is this ceramic candle? Uh, uh, also, this talks about how it works, the kind of bacteria it uh, it removes. Uh, But for large uh, scale water treatment, uh, sand filters are used and the, the large scale sand filters are made of different grades of sand, fine sand, coarse sand, and uh, uh, of course, uh, gravel at the bottom. So uh, water is then passed through these layers, meaning, meaning it, it starts from fine sand uh, to coarse 
sand and eventually percolate through gravel. Uh, sand filters for public water supply are usually built uh, in concrete containers, of course, for a few houses, small sand filters. Uh, may be used in 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 metallic containers, uh, but uh, the fact that this is large scale, uh, this sand periodically uh, has to be replaced, uh, and and the the sand filters are also periodically uh, cleaned in a, a process called the, the, the backflow system, whereby air is blown through uh, the filters to remove the particles that might have uh, gotten stuck. So uh, this is how a homemade sand filter would ideally look like. Uh, this has been, of course, drawn by myself, just as an illustration. Uh, you have clean, fine sand supported by coarse sand and then gravel. Raw water is powered on top. If this uh, arrangement was put uh, in, a, in, a, in a container, you have about uh, 60 centimeters of of fine sand, 20 centimeters of coarse sand, and, and 20 centimeters of, of gravel. As water percolates through uh, these layers, uh, by the time it reaches uh, the top, uh, uh, its smell uh, and color would have in, in, improved. Also, some microbes uh, could have been removed. So this is a typical a, a slow uh, sand filter. Uh, this water from these sand filters may require additional uh, treatment, uh, which could be physical using heat or chemical using uh, halogens like chlorine. Since some microorganisms uh, can uh, escape through uh, these layers, then chemical treatment of water, chemical disinfectants uh, are used, and uh, this depends on the killing of bacteria. Uh, the cysts or the, the protozoa that may be available uh, or present in water as well as the viruses. Common chemicals used are halogens, uh, the commonest being chlorine. Uh, and iodine. But uh, uh, most of the chemical treatment plants, as well as processes, use chlorine. So when chlorine is, is added to water, uh, hypochloride uh, would be uh, formed. And this, of course, creates acidic uh, pH uh, in the in the water uh, in which most of these uh, disease-causing microorganisms can't survive. The important points are that the killing effectiveness of this chemical will entirely depend on the concentration of the chemical. If a small concentration is put in water. Uh, the results uh, require proportional. So right concentration must be ensured as well as right contact time. There must be a minimum uh, time 
uh, for which this water is allowed to, to be in, in, in contact with the chemical to allow possible killing of, of the microorganisms. So it is not a, a matter of I pour chlorine into my water and, and then drink immediately. So uh, since chlorine is one of the uh, commonest chemicals used, uh, this can be in the in form of, of, of liquid or in, in, in form of, of powder. The, the steps for uh, liquid form chlorine and, and, and powder form chlorine are different. Shake uh, after adding uh, Oh, sorry, before adding this chlorine to the water, if it is liquid, please shake it very well. And for each uh, 20 liters of water, add two to one to two bottle tops full of liquid chlorine. Stir or, or shake the water for about 30 seconds, cover it immediately, use the water after one hour. So uh, the contact time for liquid chlorine is, is about one hour. For powdered chlorine, usually these uh, manufacturers uh, instructions are on the, on the container, add one circuit, 10 liters of water, stir well, allow the water to rest for five minutes. Uh, you can uh, you can strain using a piece of cloth without holes. We, whereby we talked about the importance of, of, of filtration. Allow water to uh, rest for 20 minutes. So by allowing water to rest for 20 minutes, this means you're allowing the contact time to, uh, first of all, allow the killing of the microorganisms. And secondly, uh, these halogens, one of the, of the physical characteristics of, of halogens is that they, they are volatile. So eventually they will uh, vaporize from the water, uh, rendering it safe for drinking. Other chemicals like uh, are the aqua tubs and iodine uh, are used, but these are not common. So you could also uh, have some time and read about them. Herbal treatment is also possible, especially using uh, Moringa seeds. And the, these Moringa seeds work in the same way as, as aluminum uh, sulfate by acting as coagulants. Temporary suspended solid material and bacteria from that water. So a tablespoonful of, of powdered moringa seeds is uh, enough to purify about one liter of water. Uh, if water, if, if if moringa seeds are added to water and it is stirred and allowed to, to settle. Suspended particles, of course, will precipitate, uh, and uh, about 98% of the coliform bacteria are also removed from the water. So you decant off the, the clean water and, and moringa seeds, of course, uh, 
could smell if left to stand, if water is left to stand for, for more than 12 hours. However, this uh, Moringa has no side effect and it is neither poisonous. So this herb can also be used Solar disinfection can also be used whereby the ultraviolet rays from the sun are used to inactivate pathogens present in water. Uh, this is uh, in addition to heating or boiling, an ideal method for treating small quantities of water at household level. So, uh, the technique, of course, involves uh, exposing water in clean, transparent bottles to sunlight. Uh, if water is left uh, to sunlight, you realize that uh, at some point its temperature will increase. Uh, so having it in the transparent plastic bottles uh, that are exposed to sunlight for a day. Uh, for example, on, a, on, on the roof of the house, we inactivate uh, most of these disease-causing pathogens. Uh, one, the, the, the roof of the house will be hot. That heat itself, in addition to the ultraviolet rays. So clean bottles uh, are needed, of course, filled three quarters shaken thoroughly for about uh, 20 seconds before they are filled completely uh, to uh, completely aerate them. So in the next uh, uh, slide, uh, this is a, a typical example of, of oral disinfection. So if this water is left for a day, uh, of course, the intensity of the uh, sun light also do matter a lot. Uh, the fact that we have talked about solar disinfection does not mean that if uh, you put your water and uh, sun on, on, a, on a crowded day, it will be safe for consumption, but the stronger the uh, the sun rays, the more uh, effective the killing of these microorganisms will be. Then later you can have this water drunk. Uh, CDC recommends some do's and don'ts uh, when performing solar disinfection or sodis which I would also wish you to uh, have a look at uh, from the CDC website. You can just put in a, uh, in a Google or in your web browser, the do's and don'ts during SODIS. Uh, Derek, uh, are you still with us? Yes, I am. All right. So uh, at what time are we ending today? Can we end at seven, maybe? Well, it's, it's fine, sir. Are we all agreeing that we can end at seven? Yeah, it's OK. Yes. I mean, we, can end at, we can end at six. Uh, <laughs> yeah so looking at uh, at the time now uh we are close to 8:30 so sorry it's uh, 6:30 uh the Methods we have just covered are uh, small scale methods of water treatment. Uh, we could 
briefly look at the municipal water treatment process, which is large scale. Of course, it applies some of the uh, principles or some of the methods that we have talked about, uh, because uh, usually the source of, of water to these municipal water treatment plants uh, is a natural source, a lake or a river, uh, whereby water has to be treated physically as well as uh, chemically. Uh, the physical treatment aims at rem removing the suspended material, ranging from large particles to small particles, clarifying and, re and removing the, the color, as well as improving the water smell. Whereas the chemical treatment uh, uh, aims at re, uh, improving uh, the safety of water by killing microorganisms. So um, we shall talk about the main stages uh, that are involved in the water treatment at municipal level or large scale. Of course, this is not common for rural communities, but you may find it in water, sorry, in large towns and cities where the, there is a network of pipes, pumps, and tanks uh, to distribute water from the treatment uh, works to the end users at household uh, or facility level. So uh, the, there are several steps that are involved, as, as uh, I already mentioned, which aim at removing solids and kill pathogens to make this water safe for drinking. So the main stages include screening and straining. Uh, uh, screening and straining aims at uh, removing uh, large and small particles respectively. Uh, for example, when we talk about uh, water collected uh, from a, a river or a lake it may have animals, it may have plants, it may, it may have uh, debris uh, from runoffs. Uh, it, it may have these uh, waste, solid wastes, uh, bottles, polythene, etc. So uh, the first step would be screening, and this usually has a large screen, uh, which is in form of a wire mesh uh, with uh, big holes. Training will also uh, involve a wire mesh, but this with small holes. Aeration, uh, which involves allowing air through the water to improve the smell. Uh, with the aeration, uh, air can be pumped uh, through uh, the water, uh, but also in, in absence of, of such a facility, water is allowed to, to stand in aeration tanks and uh, naturally uh, air, especially oxygen from the atmosphere will combine with the, with the water. Sedimentation uh, and the coagulation is usually uh, in the same uh, tank or basin, we already talked about sedimentation, uh, which allows uh, particles to settle at the bottom of the tank or at the bottom of the container. Uh, with the help of uh, coagulants like uh, aluminum sulfate, uh, which binds uh, to the particles, uh, sedimentation is made uh, easier. Filtration, uh, we already talked about uh, filters, the different types of filters, as well as disinfection with chlorine. Uh, 
uh, this is a, a typical flow of of water in a, in a, in a, a municipal water treatment uh, plant. Uh, on the left side is a stream or a river, and low water is uh, is a channeled to the pumping unit where screening and straining takes place. Aeration uh, uh, takes place. It's also called the pre-chlorination basin. Uh, some chlorine can, can be added along the way. Uh, coagulation stroke, fluctuation uh, basin where uh, these particles bind to, to a coagulant mixing basin, and then water is allowed to flow to the segmentation basin later to the filter, which could be a, which can be a slow a rapid sand filter, and then chlorination. Uh, once chlorination is done, uh, taking in consideration the concentration or the dose that is required uh, and the, the contact time, uh, water can be pumped into the pre-chlorination tanks later to reservoirs for distribution. Uh, uh, usually for uh, all cities, you have uh, these reservoirs, especially on on a raised hill. Uh, key key to uh, key example of these reservoirs is the tank here. Uh, in Kampara, for those who are in Kampara and water is pumped there. And from the reservoirs, water is expected. The design uh, of these reservoirs, water is later expected to flow by gravity uh, to the distribution points. Uh, you would uh, also have noticed that there are boosters along the water transmission lines uh, because uh, water has to be supplied to a longer distance. So uh, these boosters are to increase uh, the, the, the pressure and the flow of, of water. So uh, this is basically how the, the uh, municipal water treatment plant uh, will be arranged. Though in practice, if you visited one of the water treatment points, uh, you may not find uh, these uh, basins in that order. But the pipes that connect them uh, will, of course, uh, follow this uh, order. Uh, these uh, subsequent slides simply explain what takes place at each of these stages. For example, at aeration, there isn't treatment, uh, but rather air mixes with with the water, this helps to remove volatile substances from this water. Air and water put into contact with each other, i.e. air can be bubbled through this water as I explained earlier. Aeration can also be carried out in towers or aeration basin. Um, Aeration uh, devices range from simple uh, open holding tanks that allow uh, dissolved gases to diffuse into the atmosphere to more complex uh, aeration systems that have a column or a tower uh, filled with packing materials. So as water passes through the packed materials, the gases are released. Um, 
I, I don't know whether we have uh, someone who has gone to Mbarara or who is from Mbarara on this uh, call. Do we have any? Because the, the Mbarara water treatment site is one of the traditional water treatment plants. Okay. Paul, Paul is uh, from Barara. Paul, do you know where the water treatment plant of Barara is? I do not know. You do not know? Oh, okay. Well, it is a uh, structure on the roadside uh, as you enter Barara, but uh, I wanted to know whether there is someone who has uh, seen one. Uh, as you come close to this uh, water treatment plants, the typical aeration, uh, you see water flowing in form of fountain. And they, as water flows in form of fountain, it means air is being bubbled through this water allow the volatile uh, gases evaporate. Uh, power duration uh, using the uh, chemicals, uh, which we said when these chemicals mix uh, with turbid water and they are allowed to, 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 to stand, uh, the, uh, the particles will eventually settle at the bottom of, 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 of the uh, of the tank of the container. Uh, so data sedimentation sedimentation is, uh, is the settling out of comparatively large suspended material uh, in water. This is due to gravity. If uh, they are dense. They will think, sink to, to the bottom. And settling takes place usually in a quiet pond. Uh, this way, uh, if, if there is flow or, or con continuous flow, sedimentation may not be possible. A minimum of 24 hour retention time is necessary to have significant reduction in this suspended material. Uh, sedimentation can also be used in a, in combination with coagulation or alone. So in some water treatment plants, if visited, uh, you may find a combination of, of, of sedimentation and coagulation in the same tank. But in others, you may find they, they are different filtration. Uh, this also removes suspended material from the water uh, as uh, water passes through beds of, of porous material. Uh, we already talked about the simple filtration using cloth, using strainers, using ceramic candles, etc. But uh, in the municipal water treatment, this is done by passing through water, by pass, passing water through beds of sand and gravel, as we saw in the sand filter. So uh, the filtration in municipal water treatment is exactly the same principle used uh, for home filters and filters can be made of layers of sand, gravel, or charcoal. Uh, from uh, the small scale, 